Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining this webinar. I am Kaylee. I'm the product manager of MR at Metis. And today we will provide you with a webinar regarding 4D flow in a 3D lab. Before we start with that, I wanted to mention that at Metis we provide cardiac post processing software for multiple modalities, including CT, XA, IFS, OCT, and today's focus, MR. The MR portfolio consists of analysis for function, deformation, but also tissue characterization and flow. And that last one, that will be the dedicated topic for today's uh, webinar, and then more in specific, our 40 flow application. The purpose of today's webinar is to empathize to the straightforward clinical approach for the 40 flow analysis. I am very enthusiastic to introduce you to our guest speakers for today, Dr. Cindy Rixby and 3D imaging specialist Brian Riley, both from the Anne and Robert Lurie's Children's Hospital of Chicago. The Lurie's Children's Hospital has a dedicated pediatric CMR program and perform over 500 cases each year. During this webinar, uh, both Dr. Rixby and Brian will run you through their daily clinical use of the 4D flow analysis. Uh, thank you again for that kind of introduction and to Metis for sponsoring this webinar today on a topic that's near and dear to my heart. So my objective today will be to first uh, define what 40 flow is, demonstrate why I use 40 flow, uh, to talk about then 40 flow post processing workflow, and my 3D lab colleague Brian Riley will demonstrate 40 flow post processing from a 3D lab technologist perspective using case examples. So, phase contrast MRI is a technique that's been available for decades. Uh, we're moving nuclei experience a phase shift that's proportional to velocity. 2D phase contrast MRI is the gold standard for vascular flow, and it's routinely performed during cardiac MR examinations. So 4D flow is phase contrast MRI with flow measurements in three spatial directions and along the cardiac cycle. So 3D plus time equals 4D flow. And you can see on the image on the right, there are three uh, phase images all in different directions and we have the magnitude image as well. This is a volumetric acquisition that takes somewhere around five to 12 minutes to perform depending on heart rate, uh, the volume covered in the acquisition, acceleration technique and, and acceleration techniques used. Unlike 2D flow, 4D flow is not limited to a single plane of analysis, and it's not limited to a single direction of velocity encoding perpendicular or parallel to the flow direction, as is 2D flow. So as I said, 4D flow has been available for decades, um, but as a result of recent advances in technology, such as better coils and accelerated imaging techniques, there's been a relatively recent uh, decrease in acquisition time, so that the acquisitions now are clinically feasible. And in addition, there is vendor pulse sequence availability um, available now uh, so that people can perform these studies on their magnets. And in addition, there are now clinical post-processing tools like the Metis tool we are going to demonstrate today. And all of these advances have allowed more widespread clinical implementation of 4D flow. So 40 flow allows one to retrospectively analyze flow data in any location within the acquired volume, uh, as seen here on this aortic image with multiple analysis planes placed. Among the parameters that can be assessed uh, with, uh, with 40 flow are very similar to 2D flow. We have net flow, peak velocity, shunt flows, collateral flows, differential pulmonary blood flow, and regurgitant and fraction assessment. Uh, there is simultaneous acquisition of flow data throughout the entire volume, so there is less variability between acquisitions with 4D flow compared to 2D flow sequences that are acquired at different time points. So 2D flow is acquired uh, sequentially, and this is acquired all at one time, and that sequential acquisition could lead to physiologic changes between the individual acquisitions. And lastly, 4D flow requires less technologists scanner manipulation for cardiac plane positioning during the scan as 4D flow is a volumetric acquisition, so the technologist basically places a box over the region of interest and scans. 
This is a 40 Flow expert consensus statement published in JCMR in 2015 that I would highly recommend reviewing if you're considering 40 Flow implementation as it has standards for image acquisition and post-processing, so a really great reference article. So this is a suggested algorithm for post-processing of 4D flow data that initially includes a correction of phase offset errors. We want to inspect the source images for velocity direction, velocity aliasing, and we also want to perform any phase on wrap uh, for phase aliasing. And then we want to look at flow visualization using path lines, vectors, or streamlines, your choice. And then lastly, we perform a plane positioning or for flow quantification using 4D flow MRI. As I mentioned, uh, for flow quantification, analysis planes can be positioned anywhere within the entire volume. And we find that it's always ideal to perform a quality control measure for the acquisition. Uh, and these are some suggested quality control measures that you can perform uh, using first maybe ascending aortic flow minus descending aortic flow will equal SVC flow or using uh, QP to QS or pulmonary flow to systemic flow, which should equal one in a normal patient, or validating 40 flow against 2D phase contrast MRI if you're just beginning to use 40 flow. Uh, so all these internal quality measures are important. And if these values are equivalent that you come up with these, the data should be valid. So this is what everyone should start off with in your lab when you're uh, using 40 flow. So how does the 40 flow MRI workflow work? <laughs> uh, first, the images are acquired at the scanner. The imaging field of view is protocol is appropriate for the scan indication, and an appropriate bank or velocity encoding is chosen for the particular patient and scan indication. We always use echocardiography to choose our bank in case there are elevated banks and we want to increase our, our bank acquisition uh, from standard, which is 180 centimeters per second to any higher. Then the data goes to the 3D lab for post-processing. We've really invested in our 3D lab technologists by offering education on imaging and surgical anatomy, and we review the cases with our 3D lab tech, so they're quite familiar with our normal and complex anatomy and are able to function independently and process the 4D flow data. And lastly, a physician uh, will review the post-process data prior to dictating and finalizing. So that brings us to our cases. Um, and I'll start with case one, and we'll just give a little history uh, before we go into the post-processing. This is a 14-year-old with Marfan syndrome who has a tricomishural aortic valve and aortic dilatation. We were asked to assess aortic dimensions and aortic valve function. This was an MRA-only examination and included 40 flow. So we performed a non-contrast aortic flow, 40 flow sequence acquired in the sagittal plane to limit the volume of acquisition so that we can uh, limit our time on the scanner. And we use a standard of bank of 180 centimeters per second when acquiring this flow. And now I'm going to turn this over to Brian Riley for the post-processing. Here you go, Brian. Hi, uh, so this is Brian. Um, this is the standard Metis work screen, the uh, series above, the patients above, and the series below. We're going to start with the non-contrast series and uh, gather these series up to load into Metis. Clicking load, and they're going to populate to our side. You'll see that the series are 900 images per series, so it's a fair amount, and we're loading. And the series loaded into Metis will uh, show up to the side. And we're going to gather those up again to load them into the module 40 flow. You can right click and choose the module. Now it's going to tell us to verify flow direction. We're going to agree. This is the, again, the main flow. This is return to the original state. This is uh, the velocity direction, the noise removal, and our standard tools of uh, stacking, zooming, panning, window level. Over here is offset and phase and flow. So we're gonna go back to the uh, check velocity. We're gonna wanna see um, that each window is, 
is traveling in the direction it's supposed to be. This is head to foot, so we want to make sure the flow is going from head to foot. AP, we're going to look at the transverse going AP, A to P, and the left and right, which is hard to see, so we can change our direction here to anterior or orientation, and we can see the RPA uh, quite well. So we're going to, not that we need to, we can turn that back. Now we're going to go to our regular view, which is the 3D view. We're going to click on the noise removal. And over here, to the phase unwrap, let that process. And we're also going to do the apply offset correction. And that's done. At this point, we can stop the, the video. We can step through it image by image to get uh, maximum contrast in the vessel of interest. And we can start lining up. So we're going to line up on the uh, ascending aorta. And you can see the three views, typical MPR views that uh, most technologists, well, all technologists are familiar with. We can zoom in on it. Uh, it's important that the top center window is our through plane. That's where our flow is going to be uh, made. Um, I like to bisect my descending aorta as a routine. And then we can also change the display to no overlay. No overlay on this non-contrast, we could still do our measurements of the vessel of interest. But for our, our work today, we're going to use another overlay. We also have the speed, which you saw from loading. We'll play that. We also have vectors, which some people prefer, with uh, little arrows. Um, but I like the streamlines. So we're going to let that flow and we can make some corrections, line up so we're a little bit more plumb and perpendicular. And play. And we can also adjust our centimeter squared just for visualization sake. We'll lower this 220 and it gives us a little bit more red and if we lower it a little bit more to 100 I think we'll get a, a better picture of the flow. At this point we can stop, make sure we're adjusted properly. I'm going to step through it. And I can take pictures to add to the report, just a right click, and you'll see that you can click that snapshot. Supplying these uh, three pictures to the report helps our radiologists and our cardiologists confirm that it was taken in the right place. And we hit the flow tool, which is going to create our traditional kind of 2D flow. We uh, scroll until we get to uh, the maximum or close to maximum contrast. And we're going to add, uh, for some systems, we, we need to add the uh, patient height. So if you go to this little report, click on it. And I'm just going to drag it over. And we can add the patient height just with a double click. of the eight. Click OK and that's entered. From here we're going to draw uh, contours around the vessel of interest. I like the plotting tool. And once we have that we can go to the auto contouring button that will uh, detect the contour throughout the series. You have the option of manual tools to adjust it if need be, if you've got a pixel close to the edge. 
from here we're going to look at our data for peak velocity. Going to the report, which generates uh, this table. We do the full table, generate. It's going to expand this and down to the bottom. It gives us our peak flow velocity right there. Um, but what I find more important is to look at the columns minimum velocity and maximum velocity and locate what uh, was determined as our peak velocity and make sure there's a general bell curve around it and that there's no uh, large numbers or you know outlier pixel type numbers that need to be corrected. Once we have that, we can pick the graph, that little blue sign uh, icon, and that gives our forward flow, our regurgitant flow. Down here is our net flow and our stroke volume next to it, and then our full forward and full backward flows and our regurgitant fraction. All of this will be in the report. We can close that. Down at the bottom, if you click report, you'll see the patient data. You'll see the images that we acquired and the flow data here. Now on the left, you can add or you can uh, eliminate data that you want or don't want from the report. You can also uh, eliminate the uh, images if you didn't want to keep those. At this point, of course, doing more flows for this, I would save the session and I would title it flows. This way, um, our cardiologist, our radiologist can reconstitute this before it's sent to PAX. They can review it. Uh, we can address anything that needs to be changed. And when they get to it, we're going to go back to the browser. You'll see it down here. And it's a matter of double clicking. It'll reconstitute just like a saved state and they can make the adjustments that they want to make. Um, that's the end of the case one. I'll go hand it back over to Dr. Rixby. Thanks, Brian, for demonstrating that great case. Let me just say that I've seen that there are comments in the um, question and answer box, and I'll address some of those at the end. I'd like to get through some of our cases, and then we'll talk about those, so please know that I'll definitely go through and address those. Um, so for this case one, um, to review, this patient is a Marfan syndrome patient. Um, as we measured our dimension, uh, the aortic root was severely dilated with a maximum diameter of 30.9 millimeters. And remember that he's 14 years old, so we're uh, looking at that for, you know, per his body surface area for his size. Um, the patient has no significant aortic stenosis or regurgitation. We can see that a regurgitant fraction is effectively nothing, 1.9% on this um, data set. We have a peak velocity that we've calculated here of, you know, about 75 centimeters per second, but know that we always go and look at various um, points on the in the ascending aorta to look for peak velocity if that is our main uh, goal of the study. In this case, that was not a, a concern, so we did not go ahead and do that, but we would in a, in a case where it was a specific concern. So the take-home points for this case are that there's ease of data loading into the um, 40 flow module. The velocity assessment can be performed in any plane throughout the entire uh, aorta or other vessels, and vessel measurement is possible even on non-contrast magnitude images. So then we'll go on to case two. This is a patient, a 14-year-old with Tetralogy of Fallot, who had a transangular patch repair pair who has um, moderate to severe pulmonary regurgitation on echo, also mild pulmonary stenosis and mild RV dilatation. We at, were asked to assess regurgitant fraction, RV volume, RV function, and the branch pulmonary arteries. For this case, uh, we performed a standard cardiac MRI, which included functional analysis. We also gave a gadolinium-based contrast agent for the MRA and performed late gadolinium assessment as this was our first study in this patient uh, at our institution. For the 40 flow, we looked at whole heart 40 flow, meaning we uh, 
prescribed our box of data to encompass all of the great arteries and the heart. And for this webinar, we're just looking at flow in the vasculature, but you can also look at intracardiac 40 flow. We use a standard bank of 180 centimeters per second, given that there's no significant elevation of velocities um, that we were aware of by echo in this patient. Just to give some background data from the functional analysis, the index RV volume was mildly dilated, 160 milliliters per square meter, right ventricular ejection fraction was normal, LV index volume was 57 milliliters per square meter with a normal ejection fraction, and the right ventricular and diastolic volume to the left ventricular and diastolic volume was about two, so the RV is dilated. And so I'm gonna turn this back over to Brian to demonstrate the post-processing for this particular case. So we're gonna uh, move down to this pulmonary patient. And again, you can see it's denoted as gadolidium. We're gonna gather that up, load it. These are a little bit higher, 1440 images per series. So 7,200 images are loading. And we're gonna gather them up to put them into the module. We right click, choose 40 flow. Again, we're gonna skip over, um, this time we're gonna skip over the directional. Uh, it, I did it earlier. <laughs> and um, we're gonna start lining up uh, or, or go through our regular thing of noise reduction, uh, phase unwrap, and apply the offset correction. Gonna magnify. and start orienting for the MPA. We're gonna to try to get uh, far enough away from the valve, not to have that hinder us, and we're gonna step through and look at the contrast. A little adjustment, a little adjustment, and change it to the streamline step through it, step back. I think I'll change the color a bit. So 140, and that looks, that looks pretty good. So I'm gonna save the snapshots. And go to flow. So we're going to, um, again, like the previous one, we're going to do the flow, but this one is a little off, so I'm going to adjust the contrast, window it down a bit. And for this, you can also do this manual adjustment. We have a little recipe of eight, negative one, and four. That works pretty consistent with our system. Um, so you do have some control over this. And I'm going to plot around the vessel. and choose auto contour. And it looks pretty good, but uh, it looks like there's one or one or two slices that need to be adjusted. So I'll use the regular tools and just plot around the vessel again, tighten that in. And then again, we're gonna add in, for our system, we're gonna add in patient height One thirty-eight, and click OK. Check that, and now we're going to check our peak velocity through the report. Again, this really helps uh, me know if I have an outlying pixel that's uh, messing things up. So I'll see what the peak velocity is, and I'll just confirm again. And this is a pretty good one within the minimum val uh, bank and maximum uh, velocity, sorry, that we have a real nice bell curve and that, that peak velocity is right in the middle. So that gives me a lot of confidence in the contours. We're gonna go to the graph. And again, we're gonna see our forward flow, our regurgitant flow, our net and stroke volumes, our forward 
backward and regurgitant fraction. We can close that. That will be added into the report. We can right click and change the name of any of our flows for easier identification. And save it as we want. Of course, we'd be including uh, additional flows, but we save this. And then our, uh, let's see. We could return to the original state and again move on to another flow, which would be our standard way of, of uh, doing things. Uh, just kind of going through everything one flow at a time and this would be lining up on the ascending aorta and moving on to a flow Again, the report shows the images that we've captured, the data. Again, on the left, you can add and, and delete anything that you want to include or exclude. We can exclude the uh, images if uh, they're not necessary for your report. And again, we would save this for the doctors. And uh, that's the end of case two, and I'll hand it back over to Dr. Rigsby. Okay, so um, case two was a patient, as we said, with Tetralogy of Fallot, who has a mildly dilated right ventricle. As we saw from our post-processing, we calculated that there was severe pulmonary regurgitation with a 35% regurgitant fraction. We would have gone through and measured, and we're not going to demonstrate that in every case, but measured the branch pulmonary arteries and found them to be um, moderately to severely dilated. We would also assess our branch pulmonary artery flow with flow assessments in the right and left pulmonary arteries. And at that time for this patient, we calculated that there was a differential branch pulmonary artery flow of 53% to the left and 47% to the right. Um, so the take-home points for this are that we can calculate uh, regurgitant fraction and differential uh, pulmonary artery blood flow from a 40 flow sequence. And that vessel measurement, again, is possible on post-GAD images, a little better visualization following contrast than without contrast, but certainly possible either with or without contrast. And then I'll take this to the next case, which is our last case. And um, this is a 12-year-old who has a double outlet right ventricle whose status post the Fontan procedure. We were asked to assess ventricular systolic function, look at the Fontan circuit, assess differential pulmonary artery blood flow and collateral flow. Um, I'll just remind people for just a, a general patient, people who may not do congenital heart disease so frequently that the Fontan circuit involves a total cable pulmonary connection where the superior and inferior vena cavae are directly anastomosed to the branch pulmonary arteries as you can see in the diagram on the right with the arrows. There's no intervening pump so we have a low velocity circuit and therefore uh, we purposely acquire our images at a low velocity encoding of 80 centimeters per second to optimize the flow assessment in the um, Fontan circuit. However, just know that this may lead to aliasing in the other vessels, so phase unwrap in this situation will be important, and Brian is going to demonstrate that. We acquired uh, this case using ferromoxetol, which is an iron-based contrast, and yields substantial T1 shortening, um, and as a blood pool agent, uh, opacifies the entire blood pool, which is really optimal for Fontan assessment. Uh, as I, uh, in this case, we acquired, of course, whole heart 40 flow because we're going to be looking at multiple vessels. And as I said, a bank of 80 uh, centimeters per second, just a little bit of data on the ventricular uh, aspect of things. We had a right ventricular and left ventricular combined index and diastolic volume of 72 milliliters per square meter and um, right ventricular to left ventricular ejection uh, fra uh, fraction combined of 51%, so low normal. For a Fontan flow assessment, this is, uh, it can take a while uh, for normal 2D phase contrast acquisition as we would perform about 10 to 12 flow measurements that all have to be programmed by the technologist at the scanner if we're doing them individually as 2D flow. But as I mentioned, physiology can change over the course of measurements, especially in an awake uh, patient for 2D flow. So 4D flow in these cases offers simultaneous acquisition of all the flow values. and 
but that leads to increased post-processing time. So that's where the time is, but it does save scanner time. Um, and so it's important to make sure that your technologists are educated on all of these flows and how to acquire them um, with the 40 flow tool. And uh, in this case, Brian is going to demonstrate flow assessment in just in the Fontan baffle, but know that we, we have performed all of these uh, Fontan flow assessments for a complete evaluation of this patient. So I'll turn this over to Brian. So the third and last, we're going to go to the Fontan patient. And we're going to go down and gather up those series, load them. You'll notice that there are uh, 1,440 images per series. And as it's loading, and again from the left window, we're going to gather those up to load them into the 40 flow module, right clicking choosing the 40 flow module. You can also use the 40 flow uh, icon at the top. Um, we're not going to go through the verification process again. It was done. So from here, we have the same tools. We're going to go ahead and click the uh, noise removal. And uh, we're not going to do the face correction at this moment, but, uh, but we will in a, a little bit going to go ahead and magnify. You can see some metal artifact towards the bottom of the font hand. You can also see, uh, as we scroll through this, the um, font hand anatomy. But what I want you to see is if we line up on the ascending aorta, bisecting the descending, in the right upper panel, you can see aliasing in the ascending as well as in the descending. At this point, if we click on the phase unwrap, it takes it away. So this is part of our process of going through at the beginning of the exam is to go through these and uh, utilize these tools from the start, just in case there's some aliasing that, that's out there. So at this point, we're gonna go back to the return to original state, line up again on the Fontan. You can see this is the IVC at the top as we scroll. That's the LPA and a little bit of the RPA up to our left and the IVC down at the bottom. We're going to put on the streamlines, and we're going to change our centimeters per second to 45, which gives us a, a good range of color. We're going to line up a little bit better. And let's slow it down a little bit. You have control over the speed and step through it to find some good color. I'm going to go ahead and take some snapshots. Just do that one. And play and make a flow. So we're going back to the more traditional 2D stepping through to find a, a, a good contrast, a brightest contrast. And we're going to go ahead and use our plotting tool to plot around the vessel. And hit the auto contour. Now it looks a little off on the left. You can adjust this a little, um, but for this, we're just going to move on a, a little ahead. We're going to add the patient's uh, height 145, clicking that, and we're going to go to our view, report, to get the peak velocity, clicking the full table, generate, and expanding it. And again, 
seen what uh, was determined as the peak velocity and verifying the minimum velocity, maximum velocity columns. Um, not a lot of uh, flow. Uh, this is Venus, so it's going to be kind of slow. But we still get a general bit of a bell curve and no outlier uh, pixels. The graph, you can uh, again see the net and stroke volumes, our forward flow, our backward flow, and our regurgitant fraction. And we can return to our main window and we can rename this. So we're going to rename it as Fontan Pathway. Down here, down at the bottom, you can see the tab, and we're going to do a save as. And again, we would be doing more flows, but for our demonstration, we're just going to call this Fontan Flow. Save it. And check the report. Going to add peak velocity. Again, the data down at the bottom. We can remove the snapshot if we so wish. And that finishes the third case, and I'll hand it back over to Dr. Rigsby. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Brian, uh, for that great demonstration. And to sum up case three, this, as I said, was a 12-year-old with double outright right, right ventricle who had a Fontan procedure. We found that there were unobstructed branch pulmonary arteries with excellent visualization of the anatomy of ferromoxetol. I don't know if you noticed, really, the images were are beautiful. Um, we found that there was mildly unbalanced pulmonary blood flow based on pulmonary vein flow, and we tend to use the pulmonary vein flow in these cases to assess uh, pulmonary blood flow because there is a component of not only flow from the uh, cable flow, but also aerial pulmonary collateral flow. And we found that it was 61% right, 39% left. And we, this patient's a pretty healthy patient who has only a small aortic pulmonary collateral flow burden, about 4 to 12% of total aortic flow. And so the way that we calculate that is we have aortic flow. And the collaterals can be calculated in a couple of ways. Um, so if you take flow in the ascending aorta and subtract total cable flow um, from the IVC and the FCC, which is equal basically to descending aorta and FCC as well, um, so what's left is the aortic pulmonary collateral flow, which is that way about 6 mLs per beat, and the collaterals can also be assessed by subtracting pulmonary arterial flow from pulmonary vein flow, so you see what the contribution of the aortic pulmonary collateral flow is at about 2 mLs per beat. Um, so a really great demonstration of this case, and the take-home points from this are that you can phase unwrap uh, using the Metis tool, which is excellent. Um, you definitely don't want to get through an acquisition uh, of 40 flow spend your five to seven minutes and realize then you have phase and wrap artifact that you can't deal with. Because um, then you have to repeat the acquisition or if the patient's already gone, there's not much you can do with that. Um, and many flows are necessary for complete Fontan assessment and one acquisition for 40 flow uh, is acquired in the same physiologic state, so ideal for post-processing. However, uh, the save scanner time uh, requires additional post-processing time. And there is actually beautiful visualization of, of anatomy with ferromoxetol, so that's a really nice advantage uh, of 40 flow in this regard. So I'll just sum up these few things before we go to our question and answer session. So pulse sequence availability and post-processing software has really made 40 flow a mainstream, powerful clinical tool. As we have demonstrated today, uh, 3D lab processing uh, with a 3D lab technologist is absolutely feasible and can really optimize the cardiac MR workflows. Once uh, Brian and our 3D lab are done, with our flows, it generally takes me only a few minutes to go through and click through each of the individual flow sequences, confirm I like it, maybe do a little alteration here and there. I may go back and take a look at uh, something if there's an additional value I want to obtain. But really, this really streamlines things to let the radiologist and cardiologist uh, work on what they need to work on, which is putting the report together and analyzing the images, and lets the 3D lab work at the top of their level as well uh, in order to get the post-processing done. So I'd like to thank everyone for the attention. Um, I don't know if Kaylee, uh, uh, you have any additional comments you'd like to make before we address the questions? No, thank you. Very uh, clear presentation. Um, let's indeed uh, dive into the questions. 
Okay, I'll dive into the questions um, and we'll go back and start off with, it says, could I share some comments about uh, 40 flow protocols in children and infants? I absolutely can. Um, one thing you want to be sure of is that you're not acquiring your 40 flow images uh, as the standard adult protocol. Most, most vendors now do have a 40 flow um, commercially available tool and that will be, of course, the acquisition that you'll obtain will be optimized for an adult. And if you're scanning small children or infants, you really have to look at the spatial resolution of those scans in the field of view so that you can make sure that you have enough pixels across each of your vessels. We tend to like about four pixels across the smallest vessel that we're looking at in every patient. So if you use that um, and you can look at your field of view on your scan, you can then determine your spatial resolution requirements for those images. And I'd be happy to talk to people offline about how to optimize that. So we definitely want to do that for our 40 flow. We have um, age groups set up. We have our infant, and child and large child and adult protocols all optimized for standard patients in those uh, categories. And uh, the next question is, uh, so have you used your Siemens machines to do 40 flows um, that there have, somebody's having some difficulty uh, getting the software? Uh, yes, we do use Siemens machines for obtaining 40 flows. The images that I'm showing today were acquired on our Siemens scanner. We also have GE scanners in our house. Um, and we use these, uh, we use the standard Siemens uh, commercially available tools for our 40 flow assessment. So um, I would definitely recommend that you check in with uh, Siemens, your vendor, a representative for availability of the pulse sequence because it, it's out there. Um, the next question is, how does the pressure gradient correlate to uh, echo cast pressure gradients? And, and I think this is, a, this is something that we could talk about for probably a couple of hours, but I'll just kind of summarize it as this. Um, the, the gradient that we're measuring with cast is, of course, under probably some sort of sedation anesthesia, instantaneously acquired with, with uh, wires or catheters in a cath lab. What we're acquiring with MRI is using flow with a patient either sedated or not, uh, potentially more physiologic if not, and we're acquiring our peak velocity over multiple heartbeats because as you remember, like this sequence takes about five to seven minutes, so it's non-instantaneous, and we're actually sort of averaging multiple heartbeats to get what we're getting. Um, so we're, we may be measuring slightly different things, but the beauty of this is um, and, and, and the question is, how does this correlate? It may correlate pretty well, especially if you're using peak velocity. We've actually done measurements to calculate how well we correlate with echocardiography. We haven't done as much in the cath lab, um, but we've compared our echo with cath, and, and things do come out pretty well. So if we use uh, cardiac MR to echo, I can definitely say that using 40 flow MRI and finding our peak velocity assessments using 40 flow and the different planes, we can get an excellent correlation with our peak velocity assessments with echocardiography. And then I think people are very familiar with how echo correlates to CAT. So I'll kind of leave that as how to best answer this question. Um, and then the next thing is, does color tell me the flow velocity or the direction. And I think this is where everyone needs in their systems. So what we're looking at here, and, and I have this uh, this color-coded um, aorta still showing, what we are seeing is velocity. So um, what we're looking at is only velocity and direction of flow. You can switch from streamlines to vectors to path lines. And so in this case, we're looking at a velocity encoding. So where the red is, is increased velocity. Where the blue is, it's, it's lower velocity. And that scale can change. As Brian showed you, you can uh, change the scale of velocities that are um, displayed on your, on your acquisition, with the maximum being your peak bank. Um, and if, if you want to look at more flow direction, you can switch to vectors. Um, so that's very helpful to show the direction of velocity flow. And that's a simple click that Brian showed in our in our assessment, a simple click of the uh, in, in the tool, and that can change from color coding to uh, vector encoding. And that can give you a better direction assessment. And uh, I hope that answered that question. And the last question uh, that I have in the in the tool is, can one build separately for 40 flow acquisitions or does it fall under velocity mapping? And um, um, 
sorry to say that there is no additional bill, at least available right now, for a separate 40 flow acquisition, that it does fall under the velocity mapping, which is part of CPT code, at least in the United States. Um, I know there are others in other countries that may not have the same billing uh, requirements, but in the U.S., we can bill for velocity mapping for 40 and 2D flows similarly. Um, and I think we have one last question here that has popped up. For severe internal carotid artery stenosis greater than 70%, it is extremely difficult to recognize the signal of blood flow in the most stenosed point. However, velocity at that point could be as high as 200 to 300 centimeters per second is detected by ultrasound. So how do we solve this problem? And I guess the question is, how do we assess for peak velocity um, in, in any vessel? And I, in, when I think 40 flow is optimal for this. We really do try to get a 40 flow acquisition that is along the entire course of the vessel. So like this, we can see the aorta. We've laid the aorta out here, and then we can look for peak velocity assessments. And sometimes I use the color to help me. I'll drop the color scale as Brian has showed, and we've dropped it in this case to 138 centimeters per second. You can see that we have a little red right there in the ascending aorta. Um, and I'll point, I can point that out where our, um, where our peak velocity is. And if we actually do our acquisition, you know, our velocity and uh, flow assessment there, it's a great way to find a peak velocity assessment. And I can say that there's some research tools out there as well that will look for velocity in the entire volume of a vessel. That's not something that is part of this tool now, but I think that's, a, you know, these are things that are coming along in the future as, 40 flow post-processing clinical tools are developed. I think we'll have more, um, more tools available. But for now, I do think that using the color scale to find the peak velocity and then doing your velocity assessment right at that level is very helpful. You can use in-plane and through-plane assessment with this uh, 40 flow metis tool. So if you can't find a single plane in the transverse plane, meaning perpendicular to flow that you like, you can always take an in-plane flow so parallel to your flow direction and get a peak velocity assessment from that as well, just like you can for 2D flow. So I hope that has answered all of the questions. Um, are there any other questions out there? Um, Dr. Rixby, I noticed one other question in the chat, uh, but okay. I think it's more a medis related item. The question there is, is there or will there be an option to create a DICOM data set of the velocities in motion that can go to packs, especially with the streamlined colors? So I, I'll let you answer that, Kaylee. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, sure. So the um, due to the uh, flow measurement that is done, that specific um, location can be taken as a separate uh, DICOM data set. Uh, at this moment though, it's not uh, possible to forward this DICOM part towards PACS. Uh, all the different images are able to send to PACS. Um, so um, we have heard of this request before, so it's on the backlog, but it's currently not in the product. And um, I will just add, as you can see, these videos are from the Metis tool, the one that I'm playing here, um, or maybe it's stopped playing now, but this, um, this video is from the Metis tool. And you can click these videos in PowerPoint for PowerPoint presentations. However, they are not yet available for PACs. I do know that our surgeons really love to look at these images. Um, and I do think that it will be very helpful when Metis has this available as um, a standard tool. But for now, if you want to click these images, in, in your own um, environment, you can certainly do that and then use that for conference uh, presentation or for assessment with your surgeon uh, or cardiologist as well. So um, thank you for that question. Is there anything else that uh, I can address? Uh, well, thank you for answering all the questions. I would like to finalize um, this meeting with some uh, last um, notes. Um, so hopefully, as you have seen today during the presentation, thanks, many thanks again to the both of you, Dr. Cindy Rigsby and Brian Riley. Um, it is easy to perform a 40 flow analysis using the Meta solution. And um, although 40 flow data sets are typically large, um, as you could see, they were uh, loading 
quite quickly, actually, um, as you could see. Um, so at the Metis 40 flow analysis can be performed locally. So you don't need to send your data out and wait for results. Um, we have found that local analysis is key, uh, especially um, if a question happens to arise during the case review, you can simply return to a data set to add any additional analysis. Then, um, of course, it's uh, important that you're able to correct for any artifacts. Uh, so we provide both uh, on the fly corrections for offset and for aliasing artifacts. And the solution works regardless of the MRI scanner. Uh, it's compatible with all the 40 flow data uh, in a clinical setting currently. And it has been cleared both for FDA, but also in Europe, Canada and Australia, it can be used um, as a clinical tool. And as shown beautifully today as well, is that 40 flow is extremely valuable for diagnosis of the congenital heart diseases, but it's not limited to the pediatric cases. And um, it has been found to be quite useful for diagnosis also of uh, adult heart diseases. Oh, well, with that having said, um, I hope hope all your questions have been answered regarding. Uh, I would like to thank you a lot for your participation today. Uh, and I would like to notify you all that if you follow our LinkedIn and newsletter, that you will receive notifications for more of these interesting webinars uh, from excellent speakers. So thanks again um, to the both um, of you, Dr. Rixby and um, Brian Riley. Thanks a lot for, uh, for your contribution today. And thank you for hosting this uh, wonderful webinar on 40 Flow. If anyone has any questions in the future, please feel free to reach out to um, to me if, if through Metis, if that's possible, I can certainly answer any additional questions. So thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you all for attending. Um, have a good day and hope to see you soon.